from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Everybody knows about the yellow and green. See how one young man is about to make a name for himself with a top ag equipment maker. Another battle is brewing at the U.S.-Mexico border. If we had water from Mexico, this, work, this grove would be irrigated right now. As the cash cattle market hits new record highs. This is the best market we've ever had in the history of the cattle market. Highest prices. I want to be a part of it. What experts say are fueling the rise right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Chuck Freeby, Sports Director for the Family Broadcasting Corporation. Clinton is on assignment. The cash cattle market ended last week at new all-time highs and started this week with new cattle on feed numbers to digest. The report putting the cattle inventory as of June 1st at 11.6 million head. That's down slightly from the same time last year. Placements totaling more than 2 million head, up 4% while marketings came in at 1.96 million head, also up slightly. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us. Michelle, the report seemed bearish, so how did the futures market digest all this news? Actually, the market handled it pretty well. We did see the traders bull spread in the live cattle futures, so they bought the front months due to the record cash trade and sold the deferred contracts on the bearish placements. And that 104.3% placements number was a bit of a head scratcher because in the summer, there are more of the feed yards that are empty, waiting for that new crop of yearlings and calves to come off grass. USDA's higher than expected placements number in the cattle on feed report was a shock to the trade and is tough to explain. One analyst says he doesn't think it's an increase in heifer placement because he's starting to see some retention in the herd. Instead, it may be tied to even tighter numbers and the record cash prices for feeders and fed cattle, which have feed yards scrambling. And the only thing I can come up with is we do have, um, you know, quite a large sector of the market. We're bullish, but we know how tight these numbers are. We know how long it takes to rebuild a cow herd, and that's not going to happen overnight. So there's that anticipation of this is the best market we've ever had in the history of the cattle market, highest prices. I want to be a part of it. Marlick questions the accuracy of USDA's reports because the higher placements number from last fall should be showing up on show lists right now. But instead, historically tight supplies have led to record cash. You get the... 198 trade uh, in the north, 190 in the south. Um, that's super impressive. You know, I mean, and, and everybody's taking it. And the fact that even after the Catalan Free Report, some of that trade was still happening. And the cash move is even more impressive because it's contra seasonal. The numbers just aren't there for the middle of June or end of June for those kind of trades to happen is, is very impressive because impressive we're after the peak demand numbers. You know, usually we're starting to tail off. Show lists are starting to grow, um, but we have a lot of interest in trying to sell early. So guys are even selling some of these calves that are not ready yet. Last week in the north, the dressed cash volume was 310 to 312. That's up four to six dollars on the week, with a few up to 315. And live sale prices were from 198 to 199. Southern prices range from 189 to 191 live, up three to five dollars. So the five area weighted average will be another record. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. Thanks, Michelle. Only 18. That's how many farms USDA says are currently accepting federal funds to combat the H5N1 avian flu outbreak among dairy herds. It says Michigan has the highest enrollment for the financial assistance with 11 farms participating. Eligible farms can receive up to $28,000 over three months if they have an outbreak, and $3,500 is available to other dairy producers to improve biosecurity and test counts. At last report, H5N1 has been confirmed in 121 herds in 12 states. The Centers for Disease Control also reporting it's monitoring over 690 people for avian flu due to exposure to infected animals. That's an increase of 140 in just one week. However, the agency continues to say the risk to the general public remains low. High heat, a concern across the country this weekend, but look at what happened at one farm near Effingham, Illinois. The Teutopolis Fire Protection District says they were contacted by a local farmer 
who told them his hay was getting extremely hot inside his barn, in part due to the extremely high temperatures and humidity that the area had seen. The farmer was concerned about the hay catching on fire. Crews responded and the farmer started moving bales out of the barn. They found evidence that some already had started smoldering. They say luckily none caught fire, but it was hot to the touch. Crews say the farmer was close to losing hundreds of hay bales and a barn. And while some saw heat over the weekend, areas of the Midwest saw heavy rain. The city of Rock Valley, Iowa, activating its tornado sirens to warn residents to evacuate because of flooding in the area. The Sioux County Sheriff's Office released video showing parts of the city underwater. The Sioux Falls National Weather Service Office issued a flash flood emergency due to a levee failure on the Rock River. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds issued a disaster emergency proclamation for 21 counties. Catastrophic flooding was also reported in areas of Minnesota. Rain also prompting high water rescues in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And the high heat rages on in much of the Great Plains. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us with more. Yeah, the heat is going to be on, mainly through parts of Oklahoma into Texas, but also extending back up into Missouri. A shallow pocket of some cooler air as we go into the next couple of days. But look at that heat expanding into Cincinnati and Chicago. 97 in Atlanta, 106 in Jacksonville. Now this is more so the heat index in and across these locations, not the actual temperatures. Again, the heat index uh, up above 100 degrees. Same situation with the lows as we go through the evening Tuesday night and into Wednesday. Uh, you got more of the mid 70s, if not the upper 60s uh, with again the heat index in and across the area. So a lot of moisture wrapped up in the atmosphere to go along with a lot of that heat as well. Uh, turning the corner and into our Wednesday again, average highs are going to be well above average in the parts of Texas in Oklahoma. That's 105 in San Antonio, 104 in New Orleans with the heat index. And go ahead and take a look at your screen on this one, giving us a good laugh. Uh, Brian of Brian's Farming Videos in Ross County, Ohio, on Facebook sharing this photo, saying this is the grain cart operator of the year. Poor grain cart operators, they can never seem to catch a break. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Another potential border conflict is brewing between the U.S. and Mexico. As Rosa Flores reports, this one is all about water, or how the lack of it is putting American farmers at risk. Just turn 71. And growing citrus. That's been, always been my passion. Jose Silva, a citrus grower in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, takes us to a grove he hasn't irrigated since January. Well, this grove is about 25 years old. To show us how his life's work could be in peril due to lack of water. As you can see the leaves folding and the fruit, how, how small it is because we haven't been able to irrigate like we should. The culprits, he says, are both natural and man-made. There's the years-long drought that has reservoirs along the Rio Grande at all-time lows, according to Texas water authorities, and a dispute between the U.S. and Mexico over an 80-year-old water treaty that has Silva and many Texas farmers blaming Mexico for their misfortunes. If we had water from Mexico, this, wor this grove would be irrigating right now. I'm in South Texas. Under the 1944 treaty, Mexico, which you see over my shoulder across the Rio Grande, owes the U.S. about 390,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools of water so far this five-year cycle, which ends October 2025. When Mexico released water to the U.S. in 2020, it sparked violent protests from Mexican farmers. Currently, about 90 percent of the country is enduring its most expansive drought since 2011. We have a 1944 uh, Tratado. Mexico's foreign ministry points to that years long severe drought and says it plans to meet its treaty obligations by the October 2025 deadline. But it's too late for some farmers. Not only have some citrus growers pulled and burned their wilted groves. When you see this, it's just heartbreaking. It just breaks your heart. The entire South Texas sugarcane industry is dead forcing the state's only sugar mill, a $100 million business that employed more than 500 people to close in April, according to this man. Do you blame Mexico? Yes, I mean, this is not a act of God. This is a man-made situation. Tudor Yulhorn is the chairman of the Rio Grande Valley Sugar Growers. So is this equipment gonna be sold? 
Yes. These and says a group of 90 farmers went from harvesting 35,000 acres of sugar cane and churning giant piles of sugar like this one to producing less than 10,000 acres in February. Do you in part blame the State Department for not forcing Mexico to provide the water? It's definitely the fault of the State Department because this has occurred under Republican administrations and it's recurring right now under a Democratic administration. If you start to feel like uh, maybe the State Department doesn't care about you very much. The State Department tells CNN that the agency continues to urge Mexico to make water deliveries and continues to work with Congress to resolve the issue. We have to check with the water districts. We're in a crisis. It's at meetings like these that Jose Silva advocates for the water he needs to save his wilting groves. Is there something that maybe you guys can do to... But after much discussion... And I'm sorry we couldn't come up with a better solution for you, but... The outcome was there's no water. Could this mean that some of your groves die? There's a, there's a good chance, yes. It's really heartbreaking. It really hurts. It really does. Soybeans posting some gains to start the week. Michelle Rook will have more about that coming up. And later, John Deere announces who will be its chief tractor officer. You'll meet him coming up on Ag Day. Corn and soybeans moved in opposite directions Monday while cattle futures continued to move mostly higher. Ag Day's Michelle Rook is back with more in Markets Now. Grains closing out Monday mix. Sean Hackett is back with analysis. And Sean, soybeans to the plus side led by the meal market. So what's driving that market, you know, especially meal? Is it demand or is it something else? Well, it, I don't think it's like it's because of greater actual demand. I think there was many buyers who were more hand to mouth thinking we're going to have all this surplus meal from the biodiesel story going on and we now know that we're using all kinds of other feedstocks the crush isn't going to be what we thought it was going to be the excess supplies of meals not there and a lot of these hand-to-mouth buyers are catching up making the man look strong and obviously helping to lead the soybean complex out of a hole here yeah and i was going to say that market is really oversold here after testing what the march lows we actually broke on the on the november contract we actually broke the march lows so uh, we are we are deeply oversold. Speculators, I believe, tonight will show that we're extremely short, and we're going into a you know a U.S. day report at the end of the week that historically has provided a lot of volatility. End of month, end of quarter, lots of reasons for shorts to maybe you know get a little less and, and do some short covering here into the into the end of the week. And the corn market went down and tested some of the old lows as well there. You know, has that been a function of it being pulled down by the wheat market or is it a function of the market not being concerned about weather at this point? You just look at, we had a wet start to the growing season, um, you know, and usually for corn, which is the first market to deal with weather, you know, it, everyone's thinking we're going to have this, finally get this trend line or above trend line yield. But the reality is, it's too, too early to say any of that. I think in this report at the end of the week, quarterly grain stocks could disappoint, meaning be lower than people think. I think acres could be lower than people think. There's a lot of reasons to suggest there be some could be some bullish surprises later in the week. And I we think a lot of heat's going to come in the month of July that's going to worry the market that maybe those trend line yields could be in jeopardy. All these reasons to say that the corn market retesting the March lows has probably done the most it's going to do for a little while here. Thanks for joining us. That is Sean Hackett with Hackett Financial Advisors. We'll have more update coming up. Watch Markets Now with Michelle Rook on the Farm Journal YouTube channel, keeping you updated throughout the day on the markets at the open midday and close. Find out what moved the markets today and what to expect the market to do next. Start 
Yeah, looking at that jet stream again, you got the ridge of high pressure back into Texas, Oklahoma, even extending up into Missouri. That's what this line is indicating right here. Now, in between this ridge and this trough, may get some more showers, thunderstorms trying to develop, and then working from uh, the top left corner or the uh, the northwest down to the southeast as you go through Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But really, once we get into the weekend, it's going to be more about this ridge once again developing and strengthening over uh, nearly two thirds of the United States. Pocket of some cooler air as far south as parts of Tennessee, Kentucky and the Midwest Wednesday and into Thursday behind a cool front. As you start to see that cool air though retreat back up to the north and to the northeast by Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So already kind of looking at uh, what's going on in regards to 4th of July. Uh, well, the pattern that we are starting to see is this heat in and across the United States. We get more of a zonal flow starting to show up, but it's uh, being reinforced by ridge of high pressure back down here to the southeast, which is going to keep things very toasty uh, anywhere south of this line. As you go north of there, Saturday and into Sunday, I start to see these streams, maybe a few isolated showers here and there by Monday. That is the pattern that we're going to focus on. And one thing to keep in mind, the jet stream, which is the ridge and this trough is focused more up towards the Canadian border rather than down here to the south. So what that is going to do is shift any large systems back up towards the Canadian border and off the east coast Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. So a very quiet, hot pattern trying to set up Monday, Tuesday of next week that could also possibly carry into 4th of July. As for your temperature outlook, June 29th through July 3rd, no surprise here, hot. Oak Park, Illinois, you got some evening thunderstorms high around 89 degrees, low of 71. As for a lot in Oklahoma, mostly sunny, high around 101 degrees, low of about 78. Boston, Kentucky, mostly sunny, high of 91. Coming up, we shine the spotlight on the dairy industry and some good news about dairy consumption. And later, hundreds of submissions, but only one person was picked to be John Deere's chief tractor officer. See who just got hired. Some good news about milk consumption from the National Milk Producers Federation. It reports it was up for the first four months of the year. The organization saying U.S. fluid milk sales during the first four months up by almost 100 million pounds over a year ago. While domestic consumption for most other major dairy products was lower, yogurt and non-American types of cheeses bucked the trend. The U.S. exported 8.7 percent of its total cheese production from February to April, that's an all-time high. April U.S. milk production was 0.4% below last April's production, marking the 10th consecutive month of below year-ago levels. However, over time, the trend in the U.S. appears to be producing more milk, while seeing more consolidation. Dairyherd.com, breaking down the numbers, released in the latest census of agriculture. It shows over the span of a decade, the U.S. produced more than 25 billion gallons more milk in 2023 than it did in 2013, all while keeping cow numbers relatively unchanged. However, where those animals lived and what size operations they resided on saw big changes. And you can see where that volume change occurred state by state with those that saw an increase in blue and those that saw a drop in red. Texas seeing the biggest growth, New Mexico saw the biggest drop. For a closer look at the numbers, make sure to check out dairyherd.com. Still ahead, a nationwide search has green and yellow lovers sending in hundreds of resumes. See who is the winner of John Deere's search for a chief tractor officer next. After a nationwide search, John Deere has announced its chief tractor officer. The winner will create content for the Ag Equipment Maker's social media channels. And here's a look at his musical submission that might just create a new earworm. Everybody knows about the yellow and green. It speaks of people and the places and about the machines. And it's a passion that is burned for two centuries. And I heard they're looking for a new CTO, and that's me. Race Curtis, I'm young, funny, and handsome. A content creator, social media is my grandson. Plus, I am creative, I can sing and I can rap and I can tell you all the story. Make a tractor out of wax. As you heard, his name is Rex Curtis. John Deere says that as a recent graduate in environmental studies, Rex's knowledge and passion for the industry aligns well with the chief tractor officer position. You'll remember we told you about the search for the job in April, 
which was launched with the help of 49ers quarterback Brock Purdy. Brock calling Rex to let him know he had won. That video shared on TikTok. Guys, he's calling, he's calling, he's calling. Hey, it's Brock Purdy. We've been impressed with your skills and dedication. On behalf of John Deere, I'm thrilled to offer you the position of Chief Tractor Officer. Thanks so much for the call, Brock. I won't let John Deere down. The company says there were hundreds of applicants from 40 states, and officials say they were overwhelmed by the number of high-quality submissions received for the job. They say they look forward to having Rex on board for the one-year contract position. That's all the time we have this morning. Clinton will be back tomorrow. For all of us at Ag Day, I'm Chuck Freebie. Have a great day.